to quickly say two things. I'm an ex-visiting professor at Coleraine. My, my <laughs> thing on that ran out. And I'm also ex-president of the Industry and Technology Division Council of the RSC, um, because I, my term of office there finished in 2017, I think it was. But I still stay, stay quite closely with them. Um, the other thing was, I, I was glancing at this on the train on the way down, and I saw Cambridge University Engineers Association. When I first saw it, it was C-U-E-A. So obviously, coming from Norwich, I just thought, UEA? <laughs> Perhaps not. So what I'm, I'm going to do today is I'm going to run through um, some, some thoughts around sustainability. I'm an organic chemist, um, natural product chemist, really. But I've worked in the area of agriculture and food for um, a fair number of years. I worked in research institutes, first of all, then moved through various industry courses. And I'm going to try and give you an idea of sustainability from a number of different directions. Um, the slides, are, I'm going to run through them fairly quickly, um, but if anybody wants copies of the slides, then you, know, you, can, you can certainly make them available for anybody who wants them, and my contact details at the end. Uh, do I put the phone? Yes, please. Just take one minute. Thank you. 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 The Polish presidency plan to focus on three topics, technology, human, and nature. And all I've put in, in red um, here is the things that I think are most relevant in the context of food. Um, transformation of regions and industrial sectors, synergistic view of the three key UN conventions, climate, biodiversity, and desertification, and then things like sustainable urban environment. I'm not going to go dip, dive into those. I'm not going to go through them in detail. But it's just to give us a start point. Um, I guess you've all seen the sustainable development goals, and again, a number of those obviously relate directly to food and to, um, to, to agri-food and to, to where we're coming from in this. And we need to make sure that if we're going to achieve sustainable development goals, then we've got to do it and, and take into account all the various stakeholders involved. So, from a food standpoint, what's, what are the key issues? The first one is increased production, I think, to, to die, deal with rising populations and rising expectations. I'm going to come back to that. Waste management, which I'm just going to touch on, which is really preventing the underuse and misuse of valuable engineered and creative resources. In a food environment, if you, if you spend a lot of time creating very complex molecules and very complex foods, it seems a bit silly to take the whole lot when you're finished with it and sling it into an anaerobic digester and end up, end up with a C1, with methane that you then burn. So we have to be better at doing things with complex materials. Uh, new technology, adoption of new technology and wealth creation, I'm going to touch on economics in a minute as well. Social capital is something that, as a, from a whole, the food industry has kind of bought into, but is not quite sure what to do about it. And then health, wellness, and chronic disease may seem a strange thing, but I think the health, wellness, and chronic disease agenda is becoming increasingly important uh, as we're all getting older, as the demographics are changing, and as we're beginning to realize that diet and chronic disease are so intimately linked. So, manufacturing and industry. I'm sure you've seen these sorts of figures before. In the UK, manufacturing is 11% of GDA, 44% of total UK exports, 70% of business R&D. Um, the agri-food sector contributed 113 billion, 6.4% of gross GDA. But this, a lot of this is at variable margin. And that's one of the things to remember about the food industry. A lot of it is not like pharmaceuticals. It's not enough. I've got a quick slide about this in a minute. It's not stuff that is making massive profits. The margins are small. We've had some discussions, in fact, I just saw on the train on the way down that Dyson have decided to relocate their, um, their headquarters to Singapore. So we've had some discussion from Jeremy Hunt, amongst others, about how we could become the new Singapore after Brexit. Um, in Singapore, the manufacturing sector expanded by 2% year on year. I don't have any tips of my fingers what our manufacturing sector expanded by year on year. I don't think 10.2% is that close. Maybe a tenth of that, if we're lucky. Um, and it's responsible for, actually, it's responsible for more than 20% of GDP. And in Singapore, manufacturing actually st drives the economy forward, unlike the UK. Even in Germany, which has had a tough time over it recently, and it continues to have it, manufacturing share of GDP has remained at about 20% since 1995. And over that period of time, UK manufacturing as a share of GDP has been shrinking. So we have very much a service and banking-based economy, as we know, 85 to 90%. Um, in terms of food manufacture, <coughs> I'll just basically provide these figures again. Um, the total about 113.2 billion, and you can see how the breakdown of that is. So the manufacturing itself is about mm, slightly lower than a third of that, including the retailing is again about a third. Um, but 
the food sector, and I'm afraid I don't have figures for agriculture and fishing, it, it did increase by 78% by 2000 and 2016. The whole economy increased by 80%, so it's broadly keeping pace. But the food sector has got limited scope for growth. This is a limited consumer intake capacity, and it lo relies largely on quality improvements as opposed to innovation. Um, and um, okay, GB employed three and a half million people, at one percent increase in a year earlier, twelve percent of GB employment, but a lot of that is very low paid jobs. And, and we must recognise that. <coughs> Just looking at all statistics sometimes doesn't tell you the whole story. Um, that's fine. Um, I just wanted to quickly, um, in, in one slide again, look at the um, net return on manufacturing compared to services. And traditionally in the UK, manufacturing net rate of return has been fairly poor. Um, uh, but services is also not quite as good as it used to be, and two, the two graphs are gradually converging. Um, <coughs> what drives industry is profit. And if you look at, and this is, this is not unique to the food industry, but nonetheless it, it's an interesting way of looking at things. Um, the overall sales price is made up of the manufacturer sale price with their profit and overhead direct costs, the distributor margin, the retailer margin, so there's a lot of margins built into that. What does that mean in reality? Profit margins are fragmented. Margins and produce are squeezed. If people want to, want to be able to make more money out of that, that chain, then the best way they can do it is try to squeeze the raw material man, uh, producer. And we've heard that already from a number of people. Uh, the farmers are complaining about it. We have to subsidize farming in the UK as we do across Europe. So that's where the squeeze comes, rather than the squeeze being in the manufacturing end of things. That's probably changing with Little and Aldi coming on board because they have a different model from our traditional UK supermarkets. And it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Uh, but it is nonetheless difficult to incorporate added value. Profit margins in the food industry, um, I put up here it's a completely unreadable graph, but all I want you to pay attention to is that the net margins in food and staples retailing is 2.9%. 2.9%, that's what they've got to play with. And if you look at it compared to, to most of the others, things like the media at 10%, um, capital goods, industrial capital goods, 8.4%. Everything is looking good. The, the squeeze is coming from the top in food and drink retailing because people have got used to the idea of cheap food, cheap drink, um, relatively speaking. And that's where, so the squeeze comes from there, therefore there is no trickle down in the economics of food manufacturing. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about disruptive technologies. Um, I'm a firm believer in not having disruptive technologies. To be honest, most people don't want disruptive technologies. They always say they do, but you know, I mean, do seem to, oh, sorry, you should mention specific examples, I suppose. But established manufacturers do not want disruptive technologies. People who work in the service sector and in the banking sectors in the UK don't particularly want disruptive technologies, because they're doing quite well as it is, thank you very much. They don't want to lose track of what's going on, and they will certainly be second adopters, but they're less likely to be first adopters, because they don't want to disrupt what they already have. And there's an opportunity for the UK to actually adopt disruptive technologies in manufacturing uh, and actually do something that's going to make a real difference. So, <clears throat> I asked a question, how many, several questions, how many companies truly embrace disruption? My response would be relatively few. How does it work for them? I'm not going to touch on that, simply because I don't have time. Why should companies be disruptive? I've already mentioned a little bit about why companies should be disruptive. You should be disruptive if the status quo doesn't suit you. If you want to change things, then disrupt it. Give it a kick and see what happens. Um, will disruption help to meet sustainability challenges? No. That's an easy question. Disruption on its own will not meet sustainability challenges. Um, disruption coupled with a, an idea about where you want to go with things may but simply disruption for disruption's sake, to try and see if you can make more money out of something, that's not going to meet sustainability challenges. So, one way of embracing disruptive technology, instead of sort of saying, okay, I'm, whoops, uh, I shouldn't have done that, should I? Okay, we'll just leave that one up. Um, I, I told you I'm not an engineer, I'm a chemist, I can't cope with technology. But one way, instead of looking to see how to in, in, involve disruption in your business is actually to change your business. 
And so this is a, an example, of a few examples that I could pull together a while ago about companies, where did they start off and where did they end up? So I used to work for Wrigley. Wrigley started selling soap powder in Chicago, Bill Wrigley, and giving away chewing gum. And then they discovered that actually people weren't that keen on the soap powder, so they started selling the chewing gum instead. Uh, when Wrigley were bought by Mars, they were, I think, a six and a half billion dollar business. Not too bad for something that started out and given away with soap powder. Um, there's a few others there which you can see. Um, I quite like Tiffany's, which started out door to door stationery salesman and then moved into jewelry. Glaxo, who I also used to work for for a while, started out in a formula company in New Zealand. Although, having said that, in fairness, Glaxo amalgamated and taken over so many different companies, it's difficult to see, it's difficult to trace a core with Glaxo. Um, <coughs> But they, nonetheless, they, they did start out as a, an infant formula manufacturer. Um, and uh, you can see some of the other examples there. Again, these slides are available for you. Um, and they're, they're just quite interesting. It shows some companies have moved quite a lot, and they've moved their technology quite a lot. A lot of times they've gone into adjacent technology areas because it makes sense. If you've got technology and then you can take it into another area that's adjacent where there's more profit, where you can make more money, then it makes sense to do it. So a quote from Olaf Royce, who's a uh, disruptive technology manager for General Mills. That's a cracking title, I'm a disruptive technology manager. When I worked with Wrigley, my, my job was director of scientific discovery. People said, what are you doing? I said, I go out and discover science. <laughs> what a cool title. Um, it didn't last long enough, unfortunately. But it, well, actually, I got fed up with Chicago. But anyway, a disruptor is often used an emer it's often using an emerging technology and a new and changing consumer need under a business model is the potential to gain, gain significant share. And that's one of the important things. You adopt disruption when you want to change the status quo, you, when you want to try and grab more share, or you want to do something that's different. Um, I mean, I would argue, probably with some degree of confidence, that Apple are one of the least disruptive companies in God's earth. They're not disruptive, they're not into disruptive technology. They're into getting their technology and getting it right and getting design in. The, the way they do things is different from the way other people do it. But they're not a disruptive technology company. They're a very good adaptive technology company bringing it into what they do and making people recognize it. And they do think differently. But I would argue that's not disruptive technology. Um, but <clears throat> those disruptive technologies can be enablers in the marketplace. Even if you're not the disruptor, you, the effect you have on the marketplace can actually take things forward in the direction where other people may profit or you may profit as well. So traditionally, <coughs> traditionally emerging tech, new business models, new or changing consumer needs, that's what the guys in the mills are we're talking about after all. The new disruptors are things like lowering the carbon footprint. Efficient or resilient manufacturing. It's not just about lean manufacturing anymore. It's also about resilient manufacturing. Dealing with the fact that raw materials and, and some of the goods that you have are not going to be in the same position that they were a few years ago. And things like recycling, which I've touched on before. We've got to stop taking recycling as a way of either burying stuff or sticking it in anaerobic digesters. We must do smarter things. Um, so, is there a new way to look at things that don't follow current paradigms? And how do we deal with the 80 to 90 percent of technology failures? Because, and I, again, this is coming from the food industry, 80 to 90 percent of new innovations in the food industry fail within two years. Now, people aren't throwing money away because they, because they want to, but there is a problem here. We've got a problem of a lot of people spending a lot of time thinking up new things, and they don't work, and then they end up getting discarded. Um, quick show of hands, who's heard of the Valley of Death? Hey, that's not too bad. Right, we don't talk about Valley of Death, I think. The Valley of Death, Death Valley National Park. Um, there's the, probably the picture that you all recognize from the Valley of Death and from the phone. Uh, painted by Scotswomen. Um, but the reality of the Valley of Death We've got all these, this enthusiasm. People are charging in the Valley of Death. They're charging in with the technology. The reality is you end up with one poor guy who's left there at the end, and he's, he's definitely trying to work his way back um, to the gates where he came from because his technology has failed, and there's everything that went with the technology has failed, and all his life is him in his horse. That's actually a contemporary picture of the Valley of Death from 18 whenever it was. And, and it's... I stick it in there because it's appropriate. The Valley of Death is not some glorious thing. It's not even some particularly scary thing. All it is is a bunch of boulders and a very slim track leading out. And that is the reality of the Valley of Death. 
is that it's it's just a it's it's somewhere where you go where there's very little place to escape to, and even when you're there, it it's going to bore you to tears. It's it's not going to sit down there <coughs> horrendously disruptive or destructive. Most organisations just leak away in the valley of death. There's not this sudden moment where everything blows up on you. So that's a typical way of looking at Valley of Death. I'm sure those of you have seen it, I've seen this sort of diagram before. Deception development, technology transfer, product launch, success a new product, commercialization. But even when you get past commercialization, you're still in the Valley of Death. You don't get out of the Valley of Death until you get here, until you get success as a business. The number of businesses that get to the stage of having success as a new product based on sales figures, based on what they've done, based on what they think they're going to be able to do in the future. It's amazing. But unless they can actually make money out of it, they're still in the valley of death. There's still a chance they're going to fall back down in there and it's going to be lost. So, I, I said I'm a chemist. So, reaction pathways, that's more, that's more of my style. Um, another way of looking at the valley of death is to say, okay, Here's where we start off from. This is our technology here. <coughs> this is a technology hump that we've got to get over in order to get to the product that we will then go out and make money on. Um, so, <coughs> you certainly need to put in a certain amount here. You've got to get something in here to get over that hump. But I would argue that, um, and this is the plug for KTN, that we at KTN and other people who I think are smart about this, look at this as a way of being able to catalyze reactions. Catalyzing it means bringing down the activation energy. You guys know this better than I do, or some of you do. Um, <coughs> it's a way of bringing down the activation energy for the catalyzed reaction. And so what we're doing is we're trying to make sure that we inject the right thing at the right time to reduce that EA for the uncatalyzed reaction in order to speed this through to products and to where we can make money. And the nice thing about this, unlike a valley of death, where people look at it and say, we've got to build a bridge. Yep, you've got to build a bridge. Or we've got to put a load of rocks in here to smooth our way across. With this, if you're thinking about catalysis, and it's, it's a way of thinking, it's a, it's a different paradigm, it's a way of thinking. What you're thinking about is, you think about catalysis, the same catalyst doesn't work for every reaction. The Haber process works for the particular catalyst, other processes work for the catalyst. So you're thinking, about, you're thinking about getting products to market, you're thinking about success for your technology on a one-to-one -one basis, on an individual basis. You're not just thinking, okay, we're throwing enough money at this, then somehow, will make that magic leap, and then it will solve. Um, from TRL 4 or 5 to TRL 9, where we're actually eventually going to make money. So it's actually much smarter than that. It's actually looking at things and thinking, what is my technology? Where's the technology going to take me? What's the need? And the, the other thing about it is, if you fail up here, then you roll back down here and you'll get another chance. If you fall into a valley of death, the stigma associated with failure and that valley of death paradigm means Things are never going to crawl out of there again. Yep, that's the wrong button. So, push or pull. You can either push your technology across the valley. When it falls in the valley, there's no way out. It's permanently lost at TRL 7 or thereabouts. If you have an industry pull across an activation hill, if it fails, then it falls back to its original starting point, TRL 4 or 5. It doesn't mean it's completely useless. You're not pinning all your hopes on getting it through that valley. And you can review it, you can repeat it using different conditions, different catalysts, different products, different endpoints. And it's a different way of thinking about it. And I would argue that KTN and Innovate UK, our job is to lower that activation energy to effective technology deployment, which might even be in a different industry than one we originally thought of. And that's the way that we think about things. So I'm sorry, I, I just had to come here and do a bit of a plug for KTN and explain the way that we think about things and the way that we try and, try and make things work. <coughs> Um, UK industry, not necessarily food industry, I think that's probably key sound. Uh, that's special I've been there. But this is the way that a lot of people look at UK industry. Um, you know, it's, it's full of steaming things and fat food. I, I, my first job was with Glaxo down in Greenford. Greenford's a really important place in the history of organic chemistry because Perkins set up his first factory in Greenford to make synthetic dye stuffs. He was trying to make quinine, but you know. Instead, he made an awful lot of money out of the penny black. Um, <coughs> but even then, even when I was there, I mean, there was still a, a fairish number down in Greenford of, of these sorts of factories. Some of them are actually food factories as well. So you, you think of it as a lot of pipework, a lot of ironwork, a lot of steam. 
but the food industry on the whole is different from that. And I think we will come back, I'm, I'm circling back around to this question of what does the food industry need to do? What is the main sustainability challenge in the food industry? And um, I've got up a lot of question marks here because I don't know what the full answer is. I, I can, I'm, I'm going to try and point you towards some directions. Um, and this is where I come on to the, this question of um, health and diet and sustainability. The real global challenges in the agri-food space are clearly linked to two things. Global overweight and chronic disease increasing. And population increases, and the rise of the middle classes in Asia and to the extent Africa is putting pressure on animal protein availability. That's going to happen. That's the reality of things. Um, I can cite a whole lot of figures at you, but if we continue with our... If, if the whole world was to take on meat consumption at the level of America, we wouldn't have enough meat in five years' time. We wouldn't have enough land to grow enough meat in five years' time. It's just not sustainable. It's not doable. Um, but there is an innovative opportunity or a necessity, and is it, the, the joint challenge there is cross-disciplinary. We can actually link those two problems. And I'm not suggesting we can solve both of them, but we can, we can link the two of them together, and progress in one will give us progress in another. So in the context of proteins, proteins, it takes about, I think it's like eight kilograms of protein to use one kilogram of, of cow, something like that. Uh, with, with chickens, it's about one to two or three. Uh, even with insects, it's about one to three. So insects are not the solution. But France has committed the program of investment in proteins. They're going to put a billion in the protein program. A lot of that's going to be plant-based proteins. Dutch dietary guidelines focus on eating a less animal-based, more plant-based diet. And India and China have got a joint plant feeding program to try and prevent our, our dependence from soya. So the vision statement, the part of the solution is to, to develop new protein sources, new sustainable protein sources, and then to develop the technology that can make use of them, which can improve health and wellness, create new technologies, and build on current expertise that we have. We can't, we can't go from zero to 100 miles an hour the day after tomorrow. We need to build on the current technologies we have in things like agriculture, and food and engineering, and nutrition, consumer acceptability. And consumer acceptability is hugely important. If people won't eat it, then there's no point making it. Um, so they'll buy it once, but they won't buy it twice. And that's absolutely crucial in, in food manufacture. You can't just solve the problem. You've also got to solve the problem the way that people are going to buy into it. Um, so, the innovation needs are things like new protein sources, which is an agri food lighting challenge. Processing using advanced engineering, including things like additive manufacturing. I think about standing up and saying a bit more about additive manufacturing, but then I thought, I'm going to stand up in front of a load of engineers and talk about engineering. No, I don't think so. Um, but from a food context, actually, 3D printing and stuff is it's really not where it's at. Uh, I'm quite happy to talk about it a little bit. Health benefits of increased non-animal protein diet need to be assessed, we need to have predictive markers, we need to know what, if we start changing the diet, what's going to happen. Uh, there's an awful lot of physics involved in the gut microbiome, uh, in addition to the chemistry and the biology involved. But, cons but crucially, consumers need to accept new sources. Um, so what is being done at the moment? Sugar and salt reduction we've seen, we still need new technologies for this, we need new ways of formulating. People like things that taste sweet and salty. So how can we get people to taste things which still taste as salty, for example, but only contain a tenth of the amount of salt? Because most of the salt that you eat, um, you actually don't taste it. Most of it's buried in the food and you swallow it, and it has a physiological effect. So we need to start thinking about smart ways of making salt taste bioavailable, but not um, body bioavailable, if you like. Reformulation of healthier products, for example, higher protein for the elderly. Blockchain, I don't want to talk about blockchain, I think blockchain is, um, it's, it's a bit like believing in fairies at the bottom of your garden. People think blockchain is going to solve all the problems. In fact, it's a bit like, yeah, as soon as you've got garbage in there, it just locks up garbage, it locks up garbage in so that you can't do anything about it. I'm extremely sceptical about blockchain. Um, I think it has the potential to be really good, but equally well, People have the potential to use it in all sorts of ways, which is perhaps not quite so good. Retention of nutrients, you need to think about better ways of cooking things. 
we've got to think about ways of being able to retain nutrients in foods as opposed to, I'm Scottish, you know, the first thing you do with any vegetable is you boil it for four hours. <laughs> um, we, no, a wee bit beyond that. But we have to think about better ways of being able to cook and process food to make nutrients more bioavailable instead of eating a lot of ballast in order to get that same amount of nutrients. Um, we've got... Um, I, I skipped over that slide because there's also a whole pile of other stuff around about cognitive decline and about Alzheimer's disease, which are demographics are telling us we're going to have to deal with. Um, but the changing consumer needs, people are going to want to have to put some more effort. They want to have a sort of planet friendly. Whether they're going to pay for them or not is another matter. But they do want them, again, at this affordable cost. If you bring things in at the wrong price point, you won't sell. And if it won't sell, then you don't have a business. And if you don't have a business, then there's no matter, it doesn't matter how much innovation you have, you're dead in the market. Um, interestingly enough, this came out last week, Food in the Anthropocene, the EAT, Lancet Commission on Healthy Guys and Sustainable Food Systems. We read that as being from, um, mostly from vegetable food systems. Really interesting report, five minutes. Um, so I would recommend that you, you have a look at that report. It's quite interesting. Um, it, it sort of reworks some of the stuff that we already know. Um, and what it doesn't, what it's not very strong on is coming up with solutions and about practical ways of being able to take this forward. It's all very well having a report that says, this is all going to go wrong and unless we change things, we're, we're going to have no planet left in 20, 30, 40, 50 years time. But unless you come up with practical solutions to things, then people are not going to buy into it. Um, that just is, defines a reference diet. Again, it's not a readable slide. It's just to give you an idea of the trends. Um, but we've got to... According to reports, um, we've got to reduce meat and sugar consumption by more than 50%, which is a big ask. And you've got to do that while still retaining the food that people want. And they say civilization is in crisis. For the first time in 200,000 years of human history, we were out of synchronization. They did say that before, before the first uh, agricultural revolution, but I think that we're, in a, we're running out of slack in this. We've gone to remanufacturing, and there's nothing else to do. Um, unhealthy diets pose a greater risk to morbidity and mortality than does unsafe sex and alcohol, drugs, and tobacco use combined. That's the reality. That's the figures that are out there. And so we have to make a decision to do something about it. And I think we have to, as scientists and as technologists, we have to be prepared to, to go out there and try to work out how we can make solutions. Because it's not going to be biologists who do it. It's not going to be nutritionists who do it. It's going to be a whole plethora of different scientific skills. <coughs> so. Food quality for health and for a more resilient future, from production to processing to health and wellness and consumer awareness. I've banged on about this probably quite a lot, but it really is important that we look at that and keep change. Now, I've got to come back finally with two conclusions. And the one is, the first conclusion is, I just like this quote, because it really helps you to stay focused <coughs> on what you're doing, because what's important is the customers, what's important is the people who that you, you are trying to give your signs to. And if some of your customers want hot tea, give them hot tea. If someone cold tea, give them cold tea. If you try to split the difference by serving everyone warm tea, then it's time to rethink your strategy because nobody likes warm tea. And one of the problems that we have in the food area is that we try to say to people, okay, we're going to produce a vegetable product that tastes just like meat. Isn't that a fantastic idea? Well, no, actually. It would be much better to say, here's what we've got. How can we turn this into a really attractive product? How can we engineer it so it's really good? As opposed to trying to pretend it's something that it isn't. Because all you'll end up with is warm tea instead of proper meat. And the second one is, and this comes from Scotland, around three quarters of adults in Scotland say their diet is healthy. 65% of us, I don't live in Scotland anymore, but I take that on board, are either overweight or obese. It's that disconnect, all the time that disconnect between people, what people think and what is that the reality. 60% um, of people, of patients aged 60 or years of older, had previously undiagnosed cognitive impairment. And again, I, I didn't touch, I did touch on this very briefly, but that is one of the next big challenges. The levels of Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is a trillion dollar disease. This is something that we can begin to do something with the diet, with engineering, with all sorts of things. We've been able to make life easier even once people have Alzheimer's. Um, and then the other thing is that according to Sacken, there's no evidence that specific nutrients affect the risk of cognitive impairment or dementia. So let's not run off in the direction of thinking that changing diet actually solves everything because it doesn't. Uh, thank you. That's my contact details. Feel free to get in touch. Um, and that's me.